Cool. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, um, everybody, for uh, attending. I really appreciate it. Um, and then if I'm going too fast or if by any chance you have questions in between, please feel free to you know, either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, the, the point of this presentation is mainly to give you all kind of like an awareness of what's going on with the student veteran population um, at SMC specifically. There will be a training on May 6th, um, and it's a four-hour in-depth training on, um, uh, and they will be sent out through Campus Bulletin, um, hopefully this week. And it's an in-depth four-hour training on uh, basically veteran issues, veteran culture, uh, the military. So if you'd like to join that, um, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, so I'll get started. So. Uh, so I named it, I named this presentation Kevlar. Um, Kevlar is, I made it into an acronym, right? So Kevlar is the material that's used. It's, it was made by a company 3M, which is a ballistic paneling that they use in the military to protect um, our service members, right? Whether it's the material they use for their helmets, for their flak jackets, um, any of the material that protects them, bulletproof, bulletproof um, uh, material that was made by 3M, they named it Kevlar. So I just changed that into an acronym um, because that was what protected us while we were in the military. So I just kind of adapted that into a, um, an acronym that just says, keep every veteran learning, adapting, uh, and resilient. Um, so that's the, that's the uh, I guess, the, the intro to why it's called Kevlar. All right. First thing is um, that I wanted to kind of throw out there, if anybody has any questions or, or, or comments, please let me know. But when we look at veterans or when we think of a veteran, um, most of the time we look at, or, or we think of a veteran that's like maybe disabled, a Vietnam War era veteran. Um, you know, you see them in either a wheelchair or you see them at participating at like, a you know, veterans of foreign wars. Um, event or a parade, right? And most of them are older uh, gentlemen. That's what we kind of picture, right? We picture older male, right? Um, and uh, so what I wanted to kind of clarify is what exactly is a veteran? So just so you know, um, basically the, 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 the legal term for a veteran is a person who served in the active military um, and who was discharged or released from the military under conditions other than dishonorable, right? And the reason I want to bring that up is because there's six different types of discharges. Um, and the one that's the most favorable is an honorable discharge. Uh, honorable means basically you served your time, whatever your contract was, whether you signed up for four years, two years, but you served your time and then you, you finished your time and that's it, right? That's, that's what happens when you get an honorable discharge. Basically, you don't get in any, any trouble. Um, and, it, and when I say trouble, it could literally mean anything. Uh, so I'll go in a little bit in, in depth about that. And then the, the other thing uh, that I want to mention is now the requirement is that they serve 24 months, so two years of active duty continuously. Um, so what happens is the reason I want to bring that up is because there's a lot of veterans that don't consider themselves veterans because of the fact that they did not serve on active duty. So to give you an example, for example, you may meet a person that's in uniform that is a reservist. A reservist only goes to um, what they call drill uh, one weekend a month, right? That's not enough time. So a lot of the time they'll get out of their reserve unit or they'll, they'll discharge from the reserve time, but they won't be considered a veteran because they did not serve for two, uh, two years active duty. And I'll go a little bit into that as well. The only other way that you can uh, could be considered a veteran and not have served two years is if you were medically discharged from the mil military. So basically, um, if I got injured while on duty uh, and I only served three months, uh, I could still be considered a veteran because I was injured uh, during my duty. And then that injury led to me being medically discharged out of the military. So that I'm still considered a veteran through that. Um, so I'll go to the next one. Oh, and one thing that I wanted to bring up is that a lot of students that we run into don't consider themselves veterans because 
they did not serve in combat. Um, and it's very common for women uh, veterans to not speak about their time in the military um, just because they feel like their job was not um, like it wasn't tough enough to become a veteran. So that's one of the things that I wanted to bring up as you encounter students uh, in our in our uh, at SMC. All right. So what I was saying, the reason I was saying to picture what a veteran looks like, this is what the student veteran population looks like, right? This is a tour that they were um, that we gave for UCLA, um, and this is the veteran population, right? This is you. They're all they come in all shapes and sizes, ages, uh, races, ethnicity, um, gender, and um, so it's very important to kind of they're in 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 our amidst they're in at SMC, but no one can really identify whether they're veterans or not, right? So I just wanted to show you, share a couple pictures of our um, of our tour that we did at UCLA. Obviously, this is prior to COVID. Uh, and this is also a veteran, uh, our veteran population that we had that all these students have now transferred on. This is the Veterans Resource Center at USC. Um, several of the students in this photo are actually at USC right now. So uh, that's another thing. The branches of the military, um, there are officially six branches now. So before it was uh, just Army, Marines, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. And then the newest one is the United States Space Force. A lot of people kind of make fun of it because they don't know that it's a real uh, branch, but it is a real branch. And it's basically a, a portion of the Air Force that was separated. And they basically split the Air Force now with unique jobs uh, that are specific to the Space Force. So just wanted to point that out. Um, and then the biggest, I guess, difference that I wanted to talk about was active duty versus reserve. So for example, somebody that's active duty, if I sign a contract for, let's say in my case, right, I signed a contract for five years. I'm on active duty from the day that I joined the military until I get out after those five years. When I say active duty is, Literally, um, they tell you when to eat, when to go to the restroom, when to go to sleep, when to wake up, and you're part of the um, Uniform Code of Military Justice 24 hours a day. So with that, or 24 seven, basically, right, uh, for, for the entire time. So basically what that means is um, something as simple as shaving, right? So even if I'm on, let's say if I'm on vacation, and I'm not serving time in the military, let's say I just came home to visit my parents for a month. Um, I can technically let my beard grow out, but as soon as I report back to my unit, I have to shave, right? So even something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and you're basically, it's almost like you're signing your life away when you sign that contract because they tell you when to do everything, right? So um, it's very structured. And this happens throughout your whole uh, enlistment, which is the, the entire time that you signed up. The difference is for a reservist is somebody, like I mentioned before, they only uh, attend their military service one week in a month. And then they have a two week annual training that they attend. Um, and basically the, a lot of these uh, young women and men can be, I don't know, a student at SMC working at, Best Buy, let's say, for example, and they get orders all of a sudden to deploy somewhere or for some specific training, right? Especially now with things going on in Ukraine and um, in Russia, I mean, it, it could happen within a day's notice. So if they could be a student working at Best Buy, right, just part-time military, and all of a sudden they get these orders where they have to uh, deploy. Um, so a lot of that time affects them because now they're stressed out, especially if they have family, they have children. If they don't, right, they're thinking, oh my goodness, I have to drop all my classes. What do I do? Um, who do I contact to do this stuff? So there is something called a military withdrawal. Uh, so they can get that, um, they can get a military withdrawal through admissions and records at SMC, but they have to let us know. So a lot of the students don't do that and they freak out and then they just end up not showing up to any of your classes. So a lot of the time um, it's all about communication, but they just don't know what's out there. They don't know what they don't know. 
Um, and they're part time, you know, so they don't they don't really understand. Now they're they're freaking out about having to deploy, and that's where it becomes an issue. So those are two differences between active duty and reserve. Where active duty, you're training, you know what's happening, everything is structured. Reserve, you're you don't really know what's happening, and you're only training one week in a month. All right, next one. So these are some insights on student veterans. Um, there, I just wanted to throw these out there because a lot of people, um, you know, have either misconceptions or 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 just different myths about about veterans. So one of the things I wanted to point out is a lot of veterans will not say they're a veteran unless um, or identify as a veteran unless there's unsafe spaces. So by that I mean, um, for example, there may be an LGBTQ veteran in your class or, or, or whatnot. And they will use the veteran card at the point when they feel unsafe in the classrooms or in the space that they're in, whatever, in one of your centers and the library or whatnot, because that intersectionality of them being a veteran will kind of give people a different image regardless of their, um, their LGBTQ status. So by that, I mean that they can, they will emphasize um, their veteran identity to de-emphasize other aspects of identity, like race, gender, um, disability, or anything that is not part of the dominant culture, right? In order to be granted um, to spaces that would normally, they would be excluded from. So uh, another example of that would be um, an African-American veteran, right? They may, they may be in a space where they feel unsafe because of their, their race. Um, they may have to wear veteran stuff, whether it's, uh, you know, put on a, a, a cap, a baseball cap that says something Marine Corps or a T-shirt. Um, a lot of them have tattoos, you know, so they may have to rely on that veteran identity to get through that safe space. So those are things that that we have to kind of consider as we work with student veterans. Um, and then uh, a lot of for the the faculty there in, uh, in the uh, in the in the room right now, um, tying your course material to real world experiences usually engages a lot of student veterans because they come to SMC a lot older, right? Um, so they have that real world experience and they rely on that in the classroom setting. So a lot of the times when they when the professors or um, you know I've taught some classes to veterans as well, um, if you were if you have an inability to tie your course material to real world experiences, it doesn't give that veteran the opportunity to, to, to say, how do I apply this in the real world, right? So a lot of them have that difficult transition of how to use what they're learning in their classrooms in the real world, unless the professor ties it together. Um, one of the things that I talked about is their age, right? I, I call it the Billy Madison effect. A lot of people will call it that. If you've ever seen Billy Madison, it's a movie that Adam Sandler um, did where he was the oldest person in the classroom, right? He was the, basically a grown adult in a classroom with kids. That's usually what student veterans feel like. I'll show on the next slide a picture of that so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, because of the fact that they're older, they have that real world experience, they want to, um, they can't relate to the student population. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is dropping students from your uh, classes. So if there are faculty in here that are teaching uh, different subjects, dropping students, and obviously you don't know which ones are veterans, right? But a lot of the time what happens is they rely on them being a full-time student in order to receive housing. And this is what the GI Bill is, right? The GI Bill is basically when they sign their contract, the military agrees to pay for their education uh, up to 36 months, and it can be extended to 48, right? So most people in here understand that 48 months is not a lot of time for them to get their associate's degree and their bachelor's degree. So it is critical that they stay in classes full time. Um, and what happens is a lot of student veterans will go through whatever maybe a, a trauma, maybe they stop showing up to your class, um, they go through PTSD, they have different stressors, right, where they can't, they feel overwhelmed, and they don't know how to communicate this information to the professors, right. And one, 
uh, one of the reasons is because they feel proud. They don't want to um, admit that they're going through a tough time. So they'll stop showing up to class. Um, and then the professor, what they'll do is they'll drop the student, right? Um, so I always encourage people to reach out. Um, if not, if you can't get a hold of the student, reach out to me, please. Um, I am in the Veteran Success Center, obviously. So, um, and we try to reach out to the student because we can um, kind of alleviate some of their stressors by connecting them to different resources. We have, uh, and I'll go in depth about what the, the Veteran Success Center offers. Um, and then student veterans that are receiving F grades. So one of the, the things that happens a lot of the time is students, uh, student veterans that rely on their classes to receive their housing allowance. So what happens is they will get the GI Bill will pay for their classes, but they'll also pay for them to have an apartment, right? A housing. So what will happen is if student veterans feel like they're not doing well in a class, and they realize that they come to us or the professor will reach out, right? We use um, uh, we use the GPS, right? SMC GPS to notify when students need help. What happens is the students will have to make a decision. And if they'll say, well, if I drop this class with a W, I stop getting paid for my housing. I rather not be homeless. So what ends up happening is they'll stay in the class as long as they can and probably receive an F grade just because of the fact that they need the money for housing. So it's really, it can impact their GPA. So it's a lot of work that we have to do behind the scenes when we're doing counseling with the students, because a lot of the time they don't want to drop the class, but at the same time, um, they, you know, they're stuck in between their GPA getting hit, uh, getting, you know, affected really bad, or the fact that they have to be homeless, right? So we've had several students that, you know, we found out that they were sleeping in their car in the parking lot, right? Because of issues like this. Um, Kevin, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Uh, I was going to ask you, so are you, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, I, I mean, I don't often know the background of my student, but if they're falling behind and I alert GPS, uh, if they are a veteran, will you be contacted through the counselors uh, in the GPS system? Yes. Yeah, so actually there is a filter through GPS on the back end. Um, that will notify me that they're student veterans, um, but they have to have been identified in the system at SMC as student veterans. So that's where it becomes a little difficult. Um, but yes, yes. So uh, okay. unless unless they say unless they say that they're veterans, they identify, then it's really hard. I understand, you know, on your end. But yes. Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to know how. Yeah, because because that's you know, oftentimes, you know, GPS is the only uh, way I have of sort of moving things along and helping students get identified as, you know, in, in need. And so um, uh, it makes it a little easier that you're tied in with them. So that's great news. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, like I said, feel free to always reach out to me if you're having any issues with, you know, vet student veterans. And I'm, I'm mentioning student veterans, but this also applies to the veterans dependents. So keep that in mind. So the, the, the Veteran Success Center at, at Santa Monica College assists with veteran, if you military, the right there. Mm -hmm. military and um, their dependents. And by dependents, I mean spouses, <laughs> children, um, you know, the children of veterans, spouses of veterans, um, anybody that's connected to a veteran. So you may have a student in your class that might be the, you know, the daughter of a veteran, for example, and she's using the veteran benefits. So therefore it, it impacts them as well. Um, and then the other, lastly, is the disability services that I wanted to cover. Um, we have a person in the Center for Students with Disabilities. Um, her name is Stephanie Lewis. She is specializes on veteran issues. And so what we do is a lot of the veterans that we meet, they may have a disability, but they don't want to talk about it because there's a negative stigma related to it. When I talk to them about their disability, they always come back and say, well, you know, I don't need those services. I'm not disabled. You know, they they're and I say, well, what's disabled to you? You know, and a lot of them will say, well, I'm not an amputee. You know, I'm not in a wheelchair. And it's like, well, it's not always physical disabilities. It could be disabilities that are not visible, right? That are whether it's um, 
they, they suffered from a traumatic brain injury in the military that can cause memory problems in classrooms. Uh, PTSD can also um, cause issues with being triggered or activated in classrooms. Those are all reasons for them to be referred to disability services. Um, and I bring this up because, for example, um, I have, uh, you know, I, I, I have a traumatic brain injury uh, myself that I sustained in Iraq when we got blown up. So when I go into classrooms, when I was in grad school and undergrad, I didn't know that these services existed. So I would go to classrooms and if the lights were too bright, I had to wear my, my glasses that are prescription. So if the lights are too bright, I start getting migraines. So I'll wear dark sunglasses. And if you can imagine that seeing a student in your class, with dark sunglasses on, you're like, okay, that's kind of strange, right? But that, that person ha has no choice. So a lot of the time, they may have to sit in the back of the classroom because it looks weird. But if they sit in the back of the classroom, maybe they can't see uh, what you're presenting on, right? And they have issues with like being able to just see the if they, if they are nearsighted or, or farsighted. So they don't know that they can go to disability services to get these accommodations unless somebody brings it up to them. Um, so that would happen to me. And then what I would end up doing is I would have to wear my glasses, but I, you know, my, my teacher, I just told them like, Hey, I have this issue. Um, and most of my teachers, to be honest, were very, very cool about it. Um, but it is embarrassing. You know, I'm sitting in a classroom with sunglasses on, it could be disrespectful to professors. Um, they're like, well, is that student sleeping? What's, what's going on? Um, and then I was, I felt embarrassed because I'm the only guy in the classroom, you know, I'm, I was what, 33 going through undergrad and everybody else is in their twenties. And I'm the only guy wearing sunglasses in the classroom. So I can relate to the students and what they have, what the issues that they have going on, but it's just something to think about. And then, um, just the stigma behind being disabled, right? You don't want to be looked at any less than, or they look at it like, oh, well, I don't need any, any, uh, handouts, right? I don't need any help. I'm good. I can handle this. So their own pride will prevent them from getting these services. So always make sure that you're referring to, you know, you, like I said, feel free to email me. If you feel like there's an issue with a student veteran, I can always, um, reach out to the veteran and talk to them about it. Um, I see stuff in the chat, but I'm not sure if those are questions or Aaron, do you see anything? Um, you know, so William um, Martinez made a good point. So several of our student veterans and dependents on campus are not necessarily from the LA area and come from all across the county, which mm -hmm. is why their benefits are extremely important. Yes. Yeah. So, oh, that's awesome. Will is in here. So Will is one of our counselors in the Veteran Success Center. Um, yeah. And that's very important because if you think about, let's say that I joined the military from, let's say North Carolina, right? On the East Coast. I, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, the nicest Marine Corps base that I can relate to is Camp Pendleton, which is down in you know Oceanside, San Diego. Um, they get here and they do their time, let's say it's four years, and they realize like, hey, why am I gonna move back to North Carolina? California's got great weather, right? So they wanna stay out here. But what happens with that is that they stay out here and they have no, um, no family, no type of resources or anything that connects them to the community that they're in. So they come from Camp Pendleton, Oceanside, and they look up, hey, what's the number one school for transfer, right, to, to UCs and, and, uh, and USC. So they want to come to Santa Monica College. They will literally apply, drive all the way to Santa Monica. They're like, okay, what do I do now? I have to find an apartment. Wow, it's super expensive to live here, right? So those are the things that they're, they're thinking about and what's happening. Um, and they have no uh, social uh reinforcements they have no social um support because all their family is in north carolina right their friends and family so those are things that uh, you want to consider also um were there any other questions or comments uh, yes yeah, so we have one from paulina um i have two veterans in my classroom and knowing their background has helped me understand their needs i understand however if this is not something they've they always expose how can i i'm oh, sorry how can I know to differentiate, for example, that I shouldn't drop them for absence or no assignments because they're struggling with PTSD? Ooh, okay. So that was a lot. <laughs> so the so one of the okay. So the question was that how would they how would she know not to drop them? Is that um, is I'm, am I getting that correctly? Should, yeah, Polina, if you wanted to unmute yourself, but yes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. 
Is it? I can't see anybody, so I don't Hi. know. Hi. Oh. Sorry. Oh, hey. Um, hey, yeah, hey. Hey. yeah, I guess I, so I didn't edit. I just like type and then I'm like, oh, this is not great. Um, yeah, I good. just feel like because um, I have it, you know, when I when I send out my syllabus, I have the section policies and it basically states that, like, you know, if you're not communicating with me, if you're not submitting assignments, um, it just tells me that you're not committed to the class anymore. Mm. And I will try to communicate with the person, but I've had students in the past who, you know, did not communicate with me. And, and it was just like, now that you're telling me this, it's, it's very enlightening because it just seems like, you know, maybe they're going through a mental struggle and they really just are not mentally ready to be in the class, but they need to be, you know, like you said, for housing purposes. So I wouldn't want to drop them, but at the same time, like, how would I know? Cause I have two students in my class and it's, it's great that they told me and like sometimes you know I have one student who um, will not turn on her camera and like DSPS allowed her not to when it's when it's something that's a part of a policy in my section to have their cameras on um, so like I can understand um, them better and their needs better but I also understand that like if they don't want to expose that I also don't want to be unfair to them um, if I have to like you know say listen if you're just not turning in things if you're just not mm -hmm. participating uh you know this is this is part of what's expected of you so um like who can i do it like do i do i send you an email do i send you know the veteran center an email to check up and see if this is the case or is it just like pretty invasive to do that no so that's actually that's awesome thank you paulina that's great um and, and i'm glad that you're you know, demonstrating concern, it, it, it makes me happy. Uh, so okay. um, yeah, no, and I think one of the things you can do, we can verify if the student is a veteran. So you can always reach out to me directly and I can go and verify that they're a veteran. Now, oh, got it. if the, I mean, you could always feel free to ask them as well, but I, I can see where there, there might be a line that's being crossed that you're like, wait, am I being too intrusive? You know, um, so you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and then uh, another thing too, is we have, um, the, the issue with that is they could technically be a veteran that's not using their GI Bill. And that's where it becomes tough because if they're not using their GI Bill, that means that they're not identified in the system as a veteran unless they actually put that on their application when they applied to SMC. Okay. So, um, so, there, so if you, uh, for example, I ran into a case uh, last year where there was an instructor that reached out to me, similar situation like you, I was like, you know, was telling me, hey, I don't want to drop the student because I don't know if they're a veteran or not. And I know the issues that, mm -hmm. that go around with that. So she reached out to me. I did the uh, verification and I said, you know what? They're not a veteran. <laughs> so, lo mm -hmm. and behold, like they ended up dropping them. And mm -hmm. then the, and then um, when I saw that they're verified or that they weren't verified in our system, that means that if you drop them from the class, they are not using GI Bill benefits. So always keep that in mind too. So for example, if they're not identified because, okay, let me backtrack. If they, they have to see our veteran center if they are using GI Bill. So if they are not using GI Bill, then if you drop them, it does not impact their housing because of the GI Bill situation. Do you see mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can verify if they're veterans and then just tell you like, oh yes, this person's a vet. And then that would solve the whole situation. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, this is, this is really great. I, like I was not aware of, of the whole situation of like dropping students and mm -hmm. understanding that maybe ju they're just not mentally, you know, there. And, and um, so thank you for that. Yeah. I'll definitely look into it next time. Yeah, and let me know. And then that's another thing too. So if they are using GI Bill, that's where the issue with the receiving the F grade becomes mm -hmm. an issue because on your end as an instructor, mm -hmm. you're not, you don't want to be known as the teacher that's given all these Fs, right? It, I mean, it right. just it doesn't look great, right? Whether it's rate my professor yeah. or just evaluations, right? So, um, but exactly. in that case, that student may prefer to get an F because they don't want to mm -hmm. be known. So they're so stuck in that, you know. Sure. So I totally understand where you could end up, you know, being frustrated and you end up with like kind of an, a moral dilemma. Like, what do I do? You know? Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. That's very enlightening. Thank you so much. Yeah. And feel free to reach out to me um, whenever you have a question or if you have follow-up. Yeah, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And then I saw another person had their hand up. Yeah. Loretta, I think you had your hand up and then you put it down. Did you have a question? 
Um, no, no, I was just sort of rethinking it. <laughs> but um, no, I just I think that it, um, it just it does sort of um, it sometimes concerns me a bit, like especially with the COVID situation. I I I don't make students turn on their cameras because they. It, it's not just about being a veteran. I think they could have sisters or brothers and share a space. And I had one student whose mom liked to listen to music loudly and vacuumed every time they had class. And um, and I and I don't think it even applies just to COVID. It's um, you know, my area of expertise is originally in disability studies. People who know me know this. Um, and my problem is with the accommodations model. I think it's not a great model, but I do I do also understand it's the legal model with within which we have to work. So I recognize that, but I, I do think that like what's best for these veterans with disabilities or going through these issues should really apply to all students. Mm -hmm. um, and because in part, because you never know what the student might be going through um, or not claiming their benefits um, or not going through the GI Bill or because they're stigmatized or whatever happened in, if, if they're in the service or not they they shouldn't have to divulge it instead maybe you know i like to think about i don't know creating practices that are more equitable for everyone so that the that stigma is not there i guess yeah no that's great um, yeah thank you thank you for that that's i mean it's a great way to advocate for our students that's awesome thank you was there i see the chats like yeah. filling up so i don't know if there's questions i want to make sure i cover every yeah everything. so I, I did make a note of some of the questions so kevin if you want to continue on and then we'll we can circle back to the questions okay perfect yeah so I, I i try to make the slides short so this would be more of a conversation with everybody so thank you Aaron. um okay so going back to what i was saying the billy madison effect so this is a picture of the movie billy madison right and that's what student veterans feel like they feel like they're the oldest person in the classroom. Um, they're still trying to adapt. Um, a lot of them, you tell them, hey, so the class is gonna be taught through Canvas. They're like, what's Canvas? I've never heard of this, right? Um, because they have not been in a remote environment. Um, they don't know what it's like. They don't know, what, you know, they're expecting to be what they call old school, right? Going into the classroom, sitting down, seeing the professor lecture. Um, so they're getting, it's very hard for them to get used to the, that type of modality. And then also these are just the top five things that students talk about. This was in a research study that they did in 2018. So it's about four years old now. Um, so it's pre-COVID, but basically students reported that they feel overwhelmed because they're so used to the military being structured to where they tell them exactly right what to do right what to do when to eat when to go to the restroom when to go to sleep when to wake up so they have this this structure and then they get to smc and they're a student um and it's just a free-for-all right they don't know what what's what um i'll give you a particular story we had a veteran that was uh 38 years old so he served 20 years in the military um and i was working with them and um and this is uh, my background is in social work. So I used to be a social worker with veterans. And I remember specifically that I we got this veteran, some, assisted him with housing. And one day he calls and he says, hey, my power's out. And I said, well, what do you mean your power's out? He's like, well, none of my lights are working. So I've just been like using candles. And I was like, what? And so I, I go um, and I call his landlord and I said, hey, I don't know what's going on, but is maybe it's a blown fuse or something. But one of my clients uh, is saying that they have no power in their unit. Um, so the landlord goes, checks everything out and he's like, no, everything's working just fine. Um, and then he's like, you know, did, did he forget to pay his bill, the, his electricity bill? And so I go to the veteran, I talk to him and I say, hey, did you pay your electricity bill? And he's like, pay my bill to who? And I said, Edison. And he's like, what's Edison? Like he had no clue and he was 38 years old. And in my head, right, I take it for granted because we all know what Edison is. You're paying the electric bill. But in his case, he served 20 years in the military and he always lived on the base. So when you live on the base, the military provides that for you. So there's no payments. There's no, I don't have to pay gas, water, electricity. I don't have to do that stuff. And then the military gives you all that. Um, that's part of your contract. So if he served for 20 years, he gets out, he had no clue, right? So we take it for granted. And then he obviously has that sense of um, now he feels, now he's doubting himself. Like, oh, am I ready for this? Am I ready for the real world? 
maybe I should go back in the military. This is too much, right? I'm overwhelmed. So those are things that you're going to see with um, veterans. That's just a particular case. Um, and then adjusting to a new rhythm day to day, uh, civilian life, like I said, it's a free for all, the studying, the learning, right? Most of uh, veterans are very astute, right? They, they, they perform well in most of your classes. But if you notice, even including myself, I was the type of uh, person that was like, C's get degrees. In high school, I was a C student. Um, I tried to go to community college. It, it just wasn't for me. And that's one of the reasons I joined the military. But after I got out of the military, I'm more dedicated, I'm more focused. I ended up, you know, getting my bachelor's. I went and got my, you know, that was my undergrad. And then I got my, um, my master's at USC. So when I went there, it was completely different. I'm a lot older, I'm more focused, right? So those are the things that, um, that I have to think about when it comes to student vets. Um, and then the other thing is isolation because of some, you know, same thing that Will said earlier, they can't relate to other students uh, on campus because of their real world experience, which can lead to frustration. Um, and also they don't have a support system, a social support system. So they use the veteran center frequently. So that's why um, this pandemic has kind of, you know, ruined things for us because the center itself was a place like a hub, a safe space for them to come and hang out where now they can't do that. Um, and then another thing that, uh, that I was going to mention is the uh, post-traumatic stress. They can have activators in the class. So for uh, one of the most common symptoms of PTSD or PTS is anger right? Uh, and it can manifest in different ways. So for example, a student may, um, I had this happen when I used to work at Long Beach, a student may, for example, come go to uh, be in your classroom and may go through, um, may go through a series of thoughts. And these will lead to anger. And when it comes to that, you think of, I had this particular student, like I was saying, the student got mad, stormed out of a classroom, teacher didn't have any clue what was going on. The professor was like, what just happened right now? Um, and so they reached out to us. I talked to the student and I said, what happened? What made you leave? And he said, well, I, there was this person in the classroom, a student, and they were texting and they were like sending pictures and doing whatever, you know, he's like Twitter, whatever the heck it is. And he's like, that's so disrespectful to the professor. And then I said, okay, well, you know, what happened? And he, you know, he said, well, it just pissed me off and I couldn't take it anymore. So I literally wanted to like slap the phone out of their hand. So instead of doing that, he's like, I walked out of the classroom. Right. So, um, and the teacher had no clue that this was happening, you know, in his, in his mind. But after I explained it, we were able to explain it to the professor, like, Hey, these, this is what happened, blah, blah, blah. And the professor was like, Oh, I get it now. I had no clue that they were a vet. So those are, that's just an example. And then boredom is, uh, I just added that in there because a lot of students complain about boredom and then professors complain about students um, not being engaged. And the reason is, is because they're so used to the excitement of either being deployed or being in, in the military um, because it's go, 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 that they come to college and it seems boring, right? It's not as engaging for them. And they become uh, routine to this you know, just going to school, studying, they're like, ah, this is not fun. Um, so it may lead to them losing a lot of interest in the classes. And that's why you see a lot of uh, veterans, I mean, students in general, but veterans that always are switching their major because they thought, oh, I, I wanted to study psychology. Oh, my parents said I should study business. I want to do business now. And, and they'll always switch their majors. So that's just um, things that, um, that come up when they're using their GI Bill. Um, See, I'm looking at the time. Okay, cool, perfect. All right, so this is the current state of student veterans at Santa Monica College, and kind of I included some fun facts, I guess, about California too. So we we had at the um, at the spring of 2019, right, which is the the when the pandemic started, we had 431 student veterans at SMC. Spring 22 of this current spring, we only have 222 veterans. Um, so it's, it's, it's a huge drop off. It's basically, you know, half uh, and enrollment has been impacted throughout all community colleges. So I get it. But in relation to veterans, that's how many we have currently. Um, and then there's 41 dependents. So that means that there's spouses, daughters, sons, um, you know, children of veterans that we also assist. There's 41 that are attending SMC. 
Um, and then we always gauge about approximately 100 veterans that are not using their GI Bill. Um, mm -hmm. So they're just kind of going to classes, either using financial aid or paying out of pocket. And the reason they're doing that is because um, either they're working or they they're married, they have a spouse that's working that can support them. Um, or they just want to save their GI Bill for later, right? They're thinking, well, I got to get a master's. I only get 36 months. How, how am I going to do this? Uh, how am I going to get a degree? Um, so they rather pay for the courses now that they're cheaper and then they transfer and then use the GI Bill. Um, we do have an SMC uh, Veterans Club on campus. And then the Veterans Success Center, uh, a lot of people don't even know we, we exist or where we are. So we used to be in the Liberal Arts Building 135. That building's gone. It's demolished. And now we're located in the basement of the Cadence Center. So it's where the former KCRW radio station was. So that's where we're located. But obviously, we're not open because we're, in, we're, uh, we're still in the pandemic. Um, and then there's estimated 1.8 million veterans residing in California. Uh, and then California has got the, um, the largest veteran population in the nation. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is that L.A. County is the, uh, has the largest population of veterans within California. So those are things to kind of think about. And the last study they did is approximately 80,000 veterans and active duty service members attend a California community college each year. So there's a lot of um, student vets and GI Bill is always a, a incentive for them to go to school. Um, lastly, last thing, lastly, um, okay, I'm doing great on time. Uh, things to consider or, or when addressing student veterans is politics in the classroom may trigger veterans to either speak out or shut down. So but I, what I mean by that is, you know, as professors, uh, people have uh, academic freedom. So I understand that sometimes, I mean, you have to talk about politics, but that may also trigger a veteran to either speak out regarding their own thoughts on it um, or just shut down completely and, and just form a different image of you as an instructor, right? Because they, they don't want to talk about politics. So perfect example, this is back when you know we were in Iraq. Um, I had a professor that uh, and it wasn't a political science class, but it was it was a professor that was very that would bring his his political views into the classroom setting, and and he would talk about Iraq and why we're over there and that we're only doing the stuff for oil and all this other things. And he had no clue I was a veteran, but it would affect me emotionally because I would start getting upset. Like, you know, this guy doesn't know why we're over there. He he has no clue. Right. Um, and and then it would just make me frustrated, you know, and, and having to sit there and listen to it. But I never spoke out. I never said anything. I just kind of just shut down. I'm like, OK, whatever. I just got to deal with this for, you know, 16 weeks and I'm out of here. Um, but it could lead to negative thoughts of just education in general. Right. And I'm not saying that everyone's perfect, but those are things to consider. Um, also, veterans in the classroom setting, they always like to sit with their backs against the wall at the end. Uh, at the back of the classroom, or they want to be near an exit. And the reason why is because they always want to know where the exit routes are in case something happens. It's, we're just trained, we're in, it's ingrained in us. Uh, I still do it now, and I've been out of the military for 17 years, um, but I still do it, right? I go to a restaurant, I sit with my back against the wall, I scope everything out, I'm always observing everything, what's happening where, who's wearing what, I mean, it's, it's a lot of energy and <laughs> draining, but it's just the way that we are. Um, and another thing to consider is VA appointments. So if a student reaches out to you and says, I have a doctor appointment, I have a VA appointment that I cannot cancel, um, you know, maybe they might be a veteran just because of the fact that VA appointments, so VA is the Veterans um, Health Administration, um, and they, when you reschedule an appointment for the VA, it could take months. I mean, I, I can schedule an appointment right now with a doctor, and it'll take me like three months to see him, and I cannot reschedule that appointment because if I do, it's going to take another three months to see him again. So those are things to consider if they can't show up to your class or they, you know, they can't attend for any reason. Um, and then, like I said, students, uh, Center for Student with Disabilities, we have, you know, the accommodations that I spoke to, uh, spoke about earlier, and then just knowing the resources on campus that can assist the students, right, the Veteran Success Center, the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing, they provide therapy, it's short term therapy, so we do have our own therapist in the Veteran Success Center that provides veteran specific therapy, and they do couples therapy as well. 
Um, one of the other things uh, that I would like to mention is obviously OER classes. They're very, veterans tend to go to OER classes because they get paid for their classes, they get paid for their housing, they only get paid $500 for books. So they will try their best to take classes that are OER. And for some strange reason, a lot of veterans rely on Rate My Professor. <laughs> so that's something to, to think about as well. Um, and then I mentioned veterans identifying themselves as veterans. And then one last thing is veterans are classically conditioned to accept death just because of the way that the military is, right? So that can lead to a lack of empathy with other students, with you as a professor, as faculty, and it could lead to a lot of dark humor, right? We've had uh, faculty that, you know, had said something to me and, and, and to where they were talking to a veteran, asked them, hey, how are you doing today? And she said, well, I didn't kill myself, so I guess I'm good, right? That was very alarming, right, it, the, to that professor. And she said, well, what do I do with that information? It, 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 you know, is, is she suicidal? What's going on? And it, most of the time after I talk to the student, um, they'll just say, no, I was just kidding. Like, I was joking. I guess she didn't get my joke. And I'm, you know, and I have to sit there and explain, like, dude, she's not going to get it <laughs> like because of the fact like I get it because of our dark humor and how we are as veterans, but other people may not be as willing or as accepting to that. So um, those are just some things that I wanted to point out. And I think I'm on the last slide for questions. So uh, I think we have 10 minutes left. So it kind of worked out. Perfect. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. So I know we have a couple of questions and then there was just a couple of comments. I want to thank William for, you know, just giving the insight that you're putting in, in the chat, um, definitely beneficial. Um, so I'll start off with the question that we had. So um, this is from Eric. So I attend the Long Beach Veterans Hospital Music Therapy for PTSD. I know the facilitators have been so grateful to be able to do weekly class for veterans. Mm -hmm. Do we know if there are any group sessions like this at SMC that veterans can attend? Ooh. I mean, it would be great to have that at SMC, but no, we, we don't have, I mean, we do have a therapist uh, that's dedicated to veterans, but I don't know if he can facilitate something with music, but maybe there's something that, um, maybe something we could do with the music department, you know, like a, like a, do like some sort of collaboration with the music department. So that, that's great. a good question, great. but we Thank don't. You. Thank you, Kevin. They, they do a drum circle in Long Beach and right. it's a really great outlet. Yeah, I used to attend the drum circle in Long Beach. I used to work at Long Beach City College, so I used to go there all the time, and it was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And then I think, is it Marcy? Yes. Oh, yes, it is. Um, I want to start by thanking you for such a rich, informative presentation. This has been fantastic. I teach <laughs> awesome. in the business department, and I am thankful to be on ground this semester. In one of my classes, I have two veterans who have both self-identified as veterans and have mentioned that they, that they have PTSD. And as you said, they both sit in the back row, back against the wall, right near, right near exit. <laughs> yep. And given our masking policy, they are both very um, hands up all the time contributing to the discussion. But given the masking policy, it's difficult to hear students who are in the back row. Mm. And so I have asked all students who sit in the back row to please move up and understand so that I can hear their, their helpful contributions to the discussion. But I'm, I'm seeing now that, you know, maybe I, I, the last thing in the world I want to do is, is aggravate PTSD, but I do want to hear their contributions because they have great things to say. So I'm feeling sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. And you know, our masking policy is, I mean, Dr. Jeffrey said that it's gonna be in place through the end of the spring semester. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how to continue to engage them in the discussion and to hear what they have to say without aggravating PTSD because they're obviously very comfortable backs against the wall right by the exit. Right, right. No, that's great. Thank you, Marcy, for that. That's awesome. Um, I mean, have you, have you, um... Have you, I guess, interacted with the students and told them how you feel about it? Like, have you had that opportunity to talk with them? I definitely have. And they, they've both said that if it really makes a difference to me as a teacher and to the class, they'd be happy to move forward, but they're a lot less comfortable not having okay. the backs against the wall. And so I feel a little weird making the ask. It feels like a big ask. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe there could be, um, is there, I mean, I know they're in the back of the classroom and you can't hear them. I don't know like what the style of the seating is, if it's like auditorium, but maybe they can sit closer. If, if there's an opportunity to sit closer to you where they can hear you, um, but still have their backs against the wall. So what I mean by that, I, I don't know if your classroom is like, you know, the square auditorium type, but they can always sit like on the far side of the classroom with their backs against the wall, but still be closer to you. Do you see what I'm saying? Is that an option? It might be an option to put them Clive two exits, which would allow the class and me to, it's, it's, it's my hearing them. Mm -hmm. Be good to have them. I think they can hear me because I'm shouting through the mask. <laughs> I want to hear them because they have great things to say, but I could probably place them not with their backs against the wall, but close to exits. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. And then it just see solve the problem. Yeah. And then just see if it's an alternative. And then uh, I know the masking policies are really strict, but um, they can't even pull down their mask to speak, correct? That would be that would be counter the policy. If I allowed them to do it, I'd have to allow the whole class to have love. But right. who knows when the masking police are going to come by and bust us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're not the only one that feels that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. yeah, you could try that. And then also, you know, reach out to me if, if you want me to like facilitate a conversation or I can always reach out to them. Um, just coming from a veteran, they could be more understanding, you know, and I, I'm not saying I could solve all the issues, but I, I definitely can, you know, assist in, in facilitating like a conversation and just kind of um, having them realize, you know, empathize with you and on your situation as well, you know, because their contributions are so great, you want to be able to hear them, but, you know, they, they have to, there's got to be some leeway, right? So, yeah, so I can, I definitely can facilitate a conversation if you wanted to reach out to me. Well, your insight is really terrific. Thank you again for this session. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marcy. Um, do we have any other questions? I see a bunch of stuff in the chat, but I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if there's, I see like, I haven't read any of them, so I don't know if there are questions or not. Okay. So uh, William's just doing a couple of statements. Um, so statements not to make um, to military personnel. So how many people have you killed? What kind of action do you see in combat? I'm glad you made it back in one piece. How could you leave your family for so long? Did anyone you know die? You seem normal. Do you feel guilty? I know some people who died in combat. You signed up for this. Yeah. So a lot, a lot those are common things that a lot of student veterans will hear um, when they find out when people find out that they're veterans, you know, they'll say stuff like that. So um, not all veterans deployed, um, not all veterans are happy about their service, um, especially, you know, I, I can go in depth about other stuff, you know, whether it's military sexual trauma, um, their experience in the military that led them to just hate the military completely. believe Kevin may have frozen. Kevin, you're frozen. Oh, I think he may have been, he may have frozen. Let me take a look. Daniela, are you on the line? Yeah, I am. I think um, what Kevin was trying to, and I'll finish off what he was saying, and not all veterans are happy with their service, um, especially, you know, I know you mentioned um, military sexual trauma, which is really high in the female veteran population. Um, but it's just some experience, especially political, that some veterans, when you ask them about their service or you thank them for their service, um, they may have a negative response to it because they're, they weren't very happy uh, with their experience. So just to be mindful of that as well, because that's something um, some people are very, very proud and, you know, come from legacies and some people don't want anything to do with the military and don't even want to be labeled or um, connected to uh, the military anymore. So uh, that's just something to kind of think about when um, speaking with veterans as well. And did we get Kevin back? No. Um, I see one hand. Is it uh, 
Marcy, do you still have your hand? I do still have it up only because I forgot to put it down. <laughs> oh, don't worry, don't worry. There we go. So, I know that it's 2.58 um, and Kevin did a wonderful job at presenting. My name is Daniela Washington and I'm the project manager for the Veteran Success Center. So I help as the administrator um, oversee our project and activities, our uh, programs. And thank you, Aaron, for allowing us to present today. We will be having a four hour VetNet Ally training to become allies for the campus. We'll be providing cool t-shirts that we've designed that you'll receive as well and stickers for your offices. Um, and when you become an ally, you can use it as um, professional development. So faculty can use it for flex credit um, as well. It'll be on May 6th and the invitation will be sent out um, by the end of this week. There's a RSVP link that you'll be able to RSVP and um, get more information about the session. Uh, it's going to be four hours. It's a long one. We have an, uh, someone from the uh, Cal State Chancellor's Office who uh, created the presentation coming in to do it. It will be virtual um, and we'll have a student panel. It's going to be really awesome. So it's basically, basically going to take Kevin's presentation. And if you want to have a more in-depth, hear from students and just truly engage and go through it in depth, that's what it'll be on May 6th. Um, so we're looking forward to that and we invite you all to that. And of course, if you have any questions, I know that will um, put in the chat our email, vetsoutreach at snc.edu. You can feel free to email Kevin or myself. Will and Christina, who are also in attendance, are um, counselors for our Veteran Success Center. So we're really, we're really here to help support our veterans be successful. So please let us know how we can support you in that process as well. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, Daniela. Um, thank you to everyone who joined today.